Welcome to This Week in AI. We've got some new research showing how barriers to AI development and usage will fall, signs that regulators are circling and firing warning shots against open AI, PwC's huge billion dollar AI bet, and AI being used to literally kill people. It's been a busy week. Let's go. Okay, starting with some of the AI research from this week. And there's two things here which show how barriers to usage are falling. Now, we're not going to go into loads of detail here because they are quite technical, but the implications of both of these are really important. So first up, we've got some Google researchers that have got Stable Diffusion's image generation model working on mobile devices. Now, whilst this isn't the first time that researchers have been able to get image generation models working on mobile devices, Qualcomm did it back in February, the researchers in this paper claim that the optimizations are more universally applicable, so it will be usable on a wider range of devices. Okay, so why is this important? Why do we care? Well, when you use a tool like ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion, you are using a data center somewhere. So your information is being transmitted to a data center, which then crunches that information, sends you the image, and it comes back. This process takes time and costs money. If all of this can happen on your device, not only does that make it potentially quicker, but it also saves cost. Aside from that, there are obviously the privacy advantages of keeping all of your data on your device. So actually, this on-device processing opens up all sorts of possibilities possibilities where going back and forth to a data center each time just wouldn't be practical. In the second piece of research along this thread this week, some researchers used recurrent memory transformer technology or RMT to increase the inference tokens to 2 million. So why does this matter? If you think about most large language models like GPT-4, there are basically three main ways that these are trained. Firstly, with pre-training. So with pre-training, you feed this model a huge corpus of text like almost everything on the internet. This allows it to build basic capability to predict the next word in a sentence. Now at this stage you have a fairly unruly model that's a bit rough around the edges. Yes it can predict the next word but it'll also tell you how to make napalm, it'll have lots of biases in it and it can get pretty dark. Think of it like inviting a wild dog into your home. The next way to train a model is through fine tuning and this is where somebody, usually humans, gives the model feedback on its answer. Answers. They teach the model how to behave, they give it some rules to follow, and they try to stop it from answering questions about how to make bombs and kill people. So rather than being a wild dog, this is like a domesticated dog that will sit nicely in the corner without trying to eat your guinea pigs. And finally, you have in-context learning. This is the prompt window. So when you tell ChatGPT to write a poem for my wife Katie about our children Luna and Luca, I have then given it some additional information which it will use in its answer. Now, at the moment, large companies like Bloomberg, who who are creating their own large language models are feeding in their own pre-training data and doing their own fine tuning. This allows them to teach the model how to produce more useful responses to specific questions that are relevant to them. But the downside of this is that they have to put a lot of time and energy into training the model using their own proprietary data. But this is why having a much larger context window as shown in this study could be really useful because rather than having to train your own large language model, Potentially you could use something that's off the shelf and then feed in your company's documentation into the prompt. For example, if I wanted to ask the model about a particular policy in our company, I could feed it all of our policy documentation in the prompt window and then ask it questions on that without having to have our own proprietary model trained on all of this data in the first place. This would dramatically reduce the barrier in both cost and expertise for using AI for this type of very specific query. And it's important to say this isn't a silver bullet yet. This study shows so far having a large context window does come with downsides, in particular a reduction in quality and also longer inference times, meaning you're going to be waiting a little bit longer for ChatGPT to give you your answers. But just like the mobile devices research, this shows the direction that we're moving in and it shows the barriers to using this type of technology in a business sense, both in cost and expertise, are falling. Next up we have the catchily titled Joint State 
statement on enforcement efforts against discrimination and bias in automated systems from four federal agencies. Now, I think this statement is actually really important. Whilst it is presented as a joint statement against bias, it's basically these four federal agencies setting out their stall and saying to the AI companies, we are going to be using our powers to hold you accountable for the effects of your products. In this report, each of the agencies specify some of the areas that they are going to be looking at in AI. Now, the one that caught my eye and no doubt caught the eyes of some of the AI companies was the FTC statement, particularly the last line where it says, the FTC has required firms to destroy algorithms or other work products that were trained on data that should have not been collected. And it links to a couple of lawsuits, one with a photography app and another with Weight Watchers, where they collected user data without those users' consent. And not only did the FTC require the companies to delete the data, but it also required them to delete the algorithms that were trained on that data. Now this could be massive. If there is sufficient evidence that OpenAI has trained its models on data that was provided without users' consent, potentially the FTC could go after them for the same thing. Now, in somewhat related news, OpenAI this week revealed ChatGPT's privacy mode. This allows users to basically use ChatGPT incognito, so the feedback and their prompts don't get fed into the machine and used to train further data. In the blog post announcing this change, OpenAI also announced their business mode, which will be coming soon. This is gonna allow companies to control the access for their end users, and also so make sure that their inputs aren't used to feed the model by default. Now, rather amusingly, OpenAI also revealed that you can now export the data to see the information that it has about you as a ChatGPT user. Spoiler alert, it knows basically nothing about you other than the prompts that you've put in, any feedback that you've given, your name, address, whether you're a plus user, and your phone number. So those of us that were hoping for some treasure trove of information to find out that ChatGPT knows everything about our lives, we are sorely disappointed. <laughs> Maybe that's why they did it. But it's not just the US regulators that are looking at open AI. In this MIT interview, the EU data watchdog seems to be preparing for a bit of a showdown. Firing a similar sort of shot across the bow as the FTC has done, when asked about GDPR and its applicability to AI models, he says the European approach is connected with the purpose for which you use the data. So when you change the purpose for which the data is used, and especially if you do it against the information that you provide people with, you are in breach of law. For example, let's say that as an internet user, I'm posting on an internet forum. I might have given my consent for that data to be used by the forum. But have I also given my consent for my data and my information to be used to train large language models that are scraping that data from the website? And talking about that, Reddit this week announced plans to start charging companies to use their API to train their models. And this is despite Reddit threads being used as a core part of the training data for models by all the major companies, including Google, OpenAI, Adobe. So what does all of this mean? Well, it's clear that regulators are starting to set out their stalls and outline some of the challenges and questions that they're going to be posing to the AI companies over time. Companies like Reddit are now seeing the power of these AI models, and they're realizing the value of their data. And this could mean that that data won't be so freely available in future. Next up, we have new that PwC, formerly PricewaterhouseCooper, is investing $1 billion into its AI efforts. Now, is this just another company throwing loads of cash at Microsoft and OpenAI in order to get a short-term boost in its share price? I don't know. But apparently what they really wanna do is work with Microsoft and OpenAI to automate aspects of its tax audit and consulting services. In particular, it wants to hire more AI workers, it wants to train its existing workers in AI, and it wants to use this cash to acquire AI software firms. And PwC also used this as an opportunity to announce that they were going to start helping other companies to deploy AI in their businesses too. PwC isn't the first accounting firm to start using generative AI. KPMG, Ernst & Young, Intuit, all thought to be building their own proprietary large language models and AI tech, presumably based on their own proprietary financial data and past communications with clients. And this isn't necessarily a surprise 
surprise because for a while now people have been predicting that the impact of AI on accountancy and consultancy will be fairly significant. But one thing that might be slightly surprising is that PwC isn't anticipating this move to lead to workers actually being replaced. Mohammed Kane, vice chair of PwC said, we have 65,000 people in the US. We are not going to leave anybody behind. It's going to be a team sport. What's also interesting is that in this Wall Street Journal article, there was an interview with Eric Boyd, who is Microsoft's corporate VP of their AI platform. And he said that more than 1,000 organizations, including startups and multinational companies, are now using open AI tools in Microsoft's cloud in areas like customer support, conversational AI, summarization, writing assistance, and customization. This gives us a sense of how rapidly this technology is being deployed by companies around the world of all different sizes. And then remember, this is just Microsoft's customer base. And by the way, if you're in business and you wanna be kept up to date with the latest happenings in AI, then join the Powered by AI newsletter. This is a free weekly newsletter designed for busy people who don't have time to keep up with every tiny thing that happens in the world of AI, but want a summary of the most important things happening each week. You can sign up completely free at pbai.co or click the link in the description in this video. Okay, our final story this week is uh, interesting. This demo from Palantir, it looks like a computer game, but in fact, what we're looking at here is a demo of their artificial intelligence platform or AIP being used for defense. Now, essentially what we're looking at is a natural language platform that's being used to deploy drones, satellites, fighter planes, and ground teams to destroy some sort of enemy vehicle. The system presents options to the user so that they can choose how to kill these people, right? It's not the AI killing people, it's still the humans killing people. For now. Okay, I know what you might be thinking, what if someone bad gets this technology? They will. But aside from the sort of inevitable fear about the future of humanity, I actually think this is really important. Recently, we've seen how some of the key advancements in AI have used its reasoning capability, not just to generate text or generate images, but to coordinate agents, to deploy different agents on different tasks, to receive feedback and decide what to do with it, and then present options to the user to decide what to do next. And that's exactly what we have here. Now, sure, this model is being used to coordinate and arrange debt, absolutely. But what if instead of coordinating military units, you have your company's machinery, your team's skills and capabilities map? And what if instead of trying to identify enemy state threats, you were using this tech to analyze sentiment in your competitors' reviews in order to differentiate what you do? Or maybe crawl social media looking for trends and deciding what products to build, a little bit like what fast fashion brand Shein does. Or Maybe you want to connect and analyze vast data sets like GDP and weather, which may or may not be connected, but might allow you to predict things like buyer patterns more reliably. Now you could say this is a rather unfortunate choice of demo application for Palantir to use, but it did get everyone's attention. But what is less controversial is that platforms like this will be central to maximizing a utilization of a business's various assets in the future, whether those are machinery, human, or AI. Having the ability to coordinate different assets like this, take in loads of information and deploy them to some strategic aim. This is what all businesses try to do all day every day. How fantastic to be able to use a natural language interface like this to achieve business goals. If you've enjoyed this week's episode, let me know in the comments what are you most excited or terrified about and don't forget to sign up for the PBAI newsletter at pbai.co. Like and subscribe and I'll see you next week.